Thank you. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes as we wrap up the questioning here. Starting with Ambassador Kennedy, I want to be crystal clear. I want to go back to the very first thing we started with. Will the State Department give unfettered access, complete and total access, to the Special Inspector General to do their job? The, the, the All right. Now, that says a lot right there. No, that's, that's my concern, is the, the hesitation. The Special Inspector General for Iraq has a mandate. We yes. will provide him with all the material that is relevant to his mandate. There are other Inspector Generals with other mandates that we provide information to. And so if the Inspector General for Iraq asks me for something within his mandate, he will receive it. If the Inspector General of the State Department asks I am not understanding what would be outside of that scope. Mr. Bowen, be as direct and succinct as you can. I have only got a few minutes here. That, that question is properly placed at this table between Ambassador Kennedy and me. You have raised an important issue regarding ensuring that Congress has all the information it has come to expect from SIGR about what is going on in Iraq and specifically about what is going on with regard to transition. We have an expanded mandate over and above what is usually the case for IGs. It's, it requires quarterly reporting that is cross-jurisdictional. As we pointed out in our last quarterly report, as is very specifically detailed in that October 7th memo uh, you cited, uh, the State Department has stopped giving us information that it was giving us before. Uh, that question uh, is now before Ambassador Kennedy, and, and I am confident that, that, uh, that they will resume giving us the information. We need to ensure that you have the information about what is going on in Iraq. Ambassador Kennedy, did you care to further comment? Um, Mr. Chairman, I can only repeat my position. We provide the, the material. No need to repeat your position. I find it a troubling position, quite okay. frankly. Uh, it is something we will continue to have to further explore, because as we will with the Department of Defense. Um, there are other questions that members would like to submit. We would appreciate your, prime, uh, your, your prompt response to those questions. As we wrap up here, I would appreciate maybe if we could start with Mr. Green and just go down the table. What is your number one concern? This is a mammoth, massive task that is before us. I cannot thank the men and women who are scrambling every day, putting their lives on the line to make this thing happen. I, I hope they understand the appreciation of the American people, those of us in Congress and others, for their good hard work and, and dedication. But as we move forward, it is also imperative that we highlight the concerns that you all have. You are the closest to it. If we could just go down the line and cite what is your biggest concern moving forward? Uh, we have discussed many of them here today. I think uh, to name one or two, it is to ensure that we have the adequate oversight. It, the fact is that we are going to have a heck of a lot of contractors in country, uh, but we have to increase the oversight because that is where we leave ourselves open to waste and fraud. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tebow. Excuse me. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, pro probably my number one in the context of these discussions is falls. It's explained in our charter. We we get bound up sometimes in inherently governmental, and our charter tried to, by Congress said those functions that could should be best performed by the government versus contractors. And in that context, uh, and in our discussions here, we talked about these 14 items. Uh, I, I really think it warrants an analysis because the United States Army has built an exceptional capability over time. And to even think about transferring that capability, uh, to me, uh, introduces the potential for safety of, of government and contractor employees who reside in those locations that are protected. Thank you. Mr. Rowan. Accountability for outcomes. As Mr. Tierney pointed out, this committee and the Congress needs to know what the State Department plans to achieve. You know, what are the specific outcomes that $6 billion will be spent, if you include the program money, not just the operating money, that the State Department, if it gets it all, will receive this year? Knowing what the police development program will achieve with the 190 trainers across the country that are going out. Uh, to help the Iraqis improve. What outcomes will they achieve? Thank you. Ambassador Kennedy. Uh, achieving the adequate funding levels in order to carry out the mission that I have been tasked to do. Thank you. Ambassador. Uh, I share 
under Secretary Kennedy's concern, uh, as Secretary Gates said, ensuring that the State Department has the resources it needs to stand up this very ambitious and complex mission is critically important, and it is very urgent because there are, uh, as the Secretary said, there are facilities to be built, there are people to be hired, so we need to uh, get them the resources uh, that they need uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr. Kendall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me first correct a statement I made earlier. Uh, the numbers I gave you were not quite accurate for the uh, amount of DOD presence in the future in Iraq. Uh, the total number is approximately correct, less than 4,000. But of, of that 4,000, about 1,000 total are security assistance, and within that total of 1,000, approximately 200 or less are actually DOD or government personnel. The answer to your question, in my, my, from my perspective, is time. Time is a big factor here, and we have a great deal to do in a relatively short period of time. Uh, in the fall, the U.S. forces will start to transition very much to exiting from Iraq, and we have to accomplish a great deal before then. Uh, along with that, of course, I would add the funding concerns that were expressed earlier. Thank you. I thank you.